And he asked this question. He said, what are you praying for that is impossible? Well, as a college student, as a college student, I was working three jobs and paying my way through a private Christian university. I bowed my head and said, Lord, the most impossible thing I can think of is if you've got it anywhere in the universe and you can spare it, I need $500. <laughs> that was the biggest prayer I could think to pray. And then, and then Brother Miller said, pull out the note card that I gave you when you arrived this evening and write out your prayer. I wrote mine. I thought in my arrogance, he's going to call on some of us to share. I hope he calls on me. I'll be able to share. I'm praying for $500. Oh, how spiritual I will sound asking God for the impossible. Well, Brother Miller did not ask us to share the cards instead. He reared back and thundered from the pulpit. I'm asking you, what are you praying for that's impossible? And then he said these words. I'm praying that God will reveal the cure to all cancer in my lifetime. Well, I kind of folded my card up and slipped it in my pocket. <laughs> As I said, that was in the late 1970s. In 1994, during a routine physical, I was diagnosed with cancer. Well, I sound a little hoarse tonight. This is my fifth speaking engagement in the last uh, 18 hours. I have thyroid cancer, and it has impacted my voice. But if you've had thyroid cancer, you know the good news. Even in 1994, thyroid cancer is one of the most curable cancers. In fact, it almost has that magic bullet. The cure rate is in the high 90% range. And I remember laying in the hospital after my surgery and thinking, Am I being cured of cancer today because Don Miller asked the impossible 15 years ago? <laughs> Graduates, I challenge you, ask God for that which is worthy of being prayed in the name of Jesus. Pray bigger prayers. Don't ask for a convert, ask for a city. Don't ask for a city, ask for a country. Don't ask for a trickle, ask for blood. Ask in Jesus' name. There is another reason we can do greater works and that is in their continuation of the text. Jesus said he would ask the Father who would give us another counselor our comforter, our companion. Lots of C words can be used in that translation. Jesus was, of course, speaking of the Holy Spirit. Now we know our Bible. The Holy Spirit came in the book of Acts. And now the Holy Spirit comes into the life of every person who places faith in Christ. That's the moment of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But we also know that it is possible to quench the Holy Spirit in the context of his indwelling. It is, however, also possible to walk in the Holy Spirit's controlling or the Holy Spirit's filling. I said there were several words that could be used here. Counselor, consoler, but I like the word companion. I do not go it alone in my work. I have within me the companion of the Holy Spirit who always indwells me. And when I acquiesce my heart to him, fills me, controls me, and uses me to accomplish more than I could ever accomplish in my own strength. Students, it is. It is the great tension of seminary education. We bring you together for two, three, five, twelve years. We pour into you theological information, biblical knowledge, historical facts, preaching methods, evangelism processes, missional strategies. We expect you to learn these things. We expect you to pass tests on them. We expect you through the process of field education and evaluation to prove some competency and the capacity to grow in that competency. But in the context of all of that, your president and your faculty also remind you, trust in none of it to accomplish greater works. We do not fully understand this paradigm.
paradox, this tension, this contrast. But on the one hand, we are responsible in, as stewards before God to maximize the potential that he's given us intellectually in every way we can. But in the maximizing of who we are in the, and in the working out of the stewardship of those gifts, we must never come to trust in any of that, but instead to trust in the companion work of the Holy Spirit to do through us more than we can ever do. personally. I have three earned degrees from three different schools, all of them focused on Bible, theology, missions, and evangelism. I've written three books, two out, one to come. I've read hundreds, if not thousands, of other books. I've taught at Golden Gate Seminary in one form or another since 1993. I preach literally to thousands of people face-to-face -face on an annual basis. I've been in full-time vocational ministry service for 30 years, and I've been the senior leader of some organization for 24. I'm telling you, the sum total of all of that should say that I know something about ministry leadership by this point in my life. And yet, and yet, I still find myself every morning opening my Bible and reading it devotionally, bowing my head in some mornings, getting down on my knees and saying, God, I'm inadequate for this role. I don't have the answers. I don't have the wisdom. I don't have the insight. I don't know what to do. I'm casting myself on you and asking for the filling of your Holy Spirit. Use me today. Students, I know no better way to tell you to do it than to do it that way. Cry out for the Holy Spirit. Every single continues, and this is a new insight for me, just a few weeks old, that the text continues and says we do greater works when we obey the word of God. Now listen, Jesus said, the, excuse me, Jesus said, the one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me, and the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I also will love him, and listen, and will reveal myself in him. As you go forward in the culture in which we live, a culture of moral disintegration, and into a larger world in which we live that knows nothing of the Judeo-Christian mindset, you will discover that the more you obey the word of God and that transforming work takes place that reveals the character of Jesus Christ in you, you will discover that you will stand out more and more as an anomaly in this world. And it is my contention that in the very near future it is going to become even more true that Christians and communities of Christians called the church will be islands of sanity in a world gone mad on its own devices and desires, rejecting more and more of what is good and godly. As you reveal the word of God in your, as you obey the word of God in your life, Jesus will be revealed. And listen, as you teach other people to obey the word of God, Jesus will transform them in ways you cannot do, and he will be revealed. The greatest work of all is being able to show up, bring a person forward and say, look what Jesus Christ has done. And so tonight, Jesus, our leader, has said this very simple, this very simple statement. Follow me and do the works I did. But then also do greater works. Minister in the authority of Jesus' name. Be empowered by the companionship of the Holy Spirit. Obey the transforming word of God. And watch your ministry unfold with the supernatural happening around you and the greater works being accomplished.